100 years ago, a great inspiration to me, an ambitious Anglo-Irish mariner, married a Scottish woman and found himself working here near the banks of the Clyde. It was in these docks that he started dreaming of becoming among the first to set foot on the farthest reaches of the globe. After ups and downs, he was honored for his achievements in the era of the famed polar explorers. And then he settled down, but only to dream again of the one remaining great polar challenge, crossing the last untraversed continent on Earth over the South Pole. He gathered 26 others, and in 1914, the ship Endurance set sail towards the other side of the planet. But as those familiar with this epic journey will know, nearing Antarctica, the ship was crushed by ice flows and gales never seen before. Their hopes of success were dashed. They found themselves in grave peril with only what they could salvage before the ship Endurance sank before their eyes. Facing certain death, with just months of supplies, the captain did not lose hope. Despite incredible cold, six months of absolute darkness, all were still alive a year on, kept so by the power of hope, leadership, and teamwork, and a healthy, balanced diet of penguins. Real penguins, not the chocolate ones. Those were invented 27 years later by William, William MacDonald here in Glasgow. Bet you didn't know that. As expected, standard procedure was followed, the crew were deemed perished, and no rescue parties came. Why would they? The chances of finding them, dead or alive, were next to zero. All it would be was more risk and time and cost. So the crew of the Endurance was destined to die on the ice, hopeless and alone. Sixteen months after their ship sank, the captain saw that the end was nigh. Only one chance remained to save his crew, one chance for his people to be returned to their families. But this would mean attempting something even more dangerous and on paper quite insane. But what was the alternative? Wasting away, waiting for the end? A true moonshot a tiny island in the middle of the raging southern oceans, beset on all sides by 60-foot waves that routinely sank the largest ships 800 miles from where they stood. All they had was a small wooden boat, enough to squeeze on six of them, carefully selected for their skills in navigation and engineering and teamwork. Pascal's wager, the tiniest chance for an infinite prize, is worth taking the risk. In this case, the prize of 26 lives. No question, but no foolish move either. And so began what many believe is still the greatest open boat voyage of all time, powered above all by hope, but not just hope. Hope and three other things, endurance, adaptation, and data. Fast forward a century, and we find ourselves on the same planet, but a very different world. Satellites and atomic clocks circle the Earth. GPS is in everyone's hand, connecting every place on the planet. Thousands of boats and flights cross all the great oceans every day. UK to Antarctica can be booked on lastminute.com. And the most common crises in the Antarctic are the midlife crises of the tourists running marathons on the ice. It's 2017, in the very heart of exponential technology innovation, a Silicon Valley pioneer has just sold his incredible biotech company and is exercising at home and falls unconscious. Overexertion? No. He is diagnosed with one of the most lethal of all cancers, a brain tumor called glioblastoma multiforme, or GBM. And so he finds himself on his own Antarctica. Most are dead in 12 months. Treatment has hardly changed in 50 years. But connected by information, biotechnology, and computer science that would have deemed alien inventions on the ship Endurance, the Silicon Valley pioneer prepares to cross his incurable sea. 
he puts together his own team of six. They deeply analyze the problem with experts from around the world. They map out all of the options and risks before setting off. They sequence the tumor for its DNA, its RNA, its metabolism, its immunology, and more. His compass, his sextant, and his map are new liquid biopsies that can detect whether the cancer is growing or shrinking or evolving deep within the brain just from a vial of blood. Assisted by artificial intelligence, they plan which combinations of therapies to take in which order. They monitor their progress continually, recording meticulously, enduring and adapting, enduring and adapting, but always driven by data and sharing it. 18 months later, they are still going strong and on target to reach their tiny island. In the same year, here in the UK, Several thousand other people received the same diagnosis and were receiving standard care and facing their fate. On her way to dinner to support budding social entrepreneurs, a remarkable woman, a former social worker turned MP, turned peer in the House of Lords, a campaigner her whole life for social justice, the person who brought us the 2012 Olympic Games fell unconscious, without warning, getting into a taxi before her 70th birthday. Overexertion? No. She, too, received the devastating diagnosis of GBM. A friend of hers heard about what was going on in Silicon Valley, and special centers far and wide, exploring new routes to treatment, offered all their services to her, and so began her journey to cross the incurable sea. Despite unprecedented access to every conceivable option, the only thing driving her was to get access to this approach for everyone. There was a turning point in her journey, one I've never seen before in my career, and one I shall never forget. The only time she cried in her illness was when she was in a waiting room with all the other patients like her. And there she realized it was only because of access and privilege that they had fewer choices. She immediately moved to hold a debate in the House of Lords to bring about flash freezing of tumors for deeper diagnosis, better collaboration and data sharing, and for advanced adaptive trials to become routine practice. What are adaptive trials? Well, let's go back to Sir Ernest Shackleton's boat and the tiny island. Before setting off, they deeply analyzed all the problems and all the options, and then they plotted a path, chose a crew, equipped themselves with what they thought they would need, and most importantly, they took the tools to navigate, navigate their position to persist or adjust at every possible moment. Why don't we do this in real time, in navigation and adaptation, in medicine, even though we're doing it every day, crossing oceans in boats and planes? Let's take an example if we were to use our current medical science approach for aviation. This is how it would go. We're here in Glasgow, and someone comes up with a bright idea and believes they've made a new discovery, a new route, where people for the first time can fly from here all the way to New York without stopping. So we design an experiment, and we put 100 planes in exactly this direction. 20 of them get to Boston. 20 of them get to New York. 20 of them make it all the way to Washington, D.C and 40 of them fall out of the sky, land in the ocean, just like they did before. And then for the next 100 years, or until we get new evidence, we fly exactly that same route. That's aviation, using the medical science model. No, of course we don't do that. We analyze the weather for every flight before we take off. We plan each route individually. We measure our exact position in real time and adapt recording everything that we're doing, reporting to the plane behind us and the plane behind that and the plane behind that. And if we get a great result, we learn from it. If a plane falls out of the sky, we do the same. We're not afraid to shout for help. We learn from analyzing millions of these flights, discovering what will work and what will not. It's become routine in aviation and many other industries, but not medicine. Because it was impossible and unaffordable until just a few years ago. 
but it is becoming practical and possible now, and not just for a lucky few in Silicon Valley. Scientists hearing this will be writhing. The scientist in me is writhing too, because how do you know which drug is working and which is not? This isn't good medical science. Yes, it's terrible medical science, but it's brilliant engineering. It's brilliant data science. And facing complex systems problems like late-stage cancers, where there is no single solution, a patient can't wait for medical science to work alone. We need to combine medical science with data science. Many cancers are complex webs of diseases. Finding a cure is like finding 20 fast-moving needles in a haystack all at the same time. Our current methods of research are so powerful, but we must now add to it a new approach. We can now rethink cancer research and cancer care. Tessa and her amazing daughter Jess founded Act for Cancer in January 2018, triggering the UK government-led brain cancer mission, the Dame Tessa Jowell Brain Cancer Mission, as it is now called. ACT, ACT, Adaptive Collaborative Treatments, aims to make adaptive trials an option for all, supported by trained patient advocates. Those on adaptive trials will have their tumor properly frozen, deeply sequenced, better understood, the routes through an approved pool of target therapies or immunotherapies or metabolic therapies or maybe even diets will be laid out, computed by AI, navigated by doctors, collaborating with each other, embracing the choices of patients and their loved ones. These therapies need not be expensive or toxic. They may be new ones, they could be old ones, they could be for other cancers or used in other things. We can recalculate our position using extraordinary new liquid biopsies every week or two. We're on a little wooden boat. Are we on track, drifting around, going backwards? Are we sinking or floating? Is it time to change course, just like every ship and every plane crossing the oceans today? And we will record and learn all the real-world outcomes, what the patient and their loved ones are seeing in their expert eyes. This mission will be the first, I hope, national-scale adaptive treatment platform, not just for GBM, but for all incurable cancers and then perhaps for other diseases too. For me, after 20 years as a doctor and 30 as a geek, it's a turning point in the way that research, we research medicine as scientists, how we practice medicine as doctors, and how we believe in medicine as patients. Shackleton made it to South Georgia Island. It was not a fluke. Our Silicon Valley pioneer is well on his way, along with several others following his path. Tessa also tried and with as much love and care around her that anyone could dream of. But sadly, just over two weeks ago, 11 months after diagnosis, she was suddenly swept away by one of those 60-foot waves, but not in vain. She famously said, what gives a life meaning is not only how it is lived, but how it draws to a close. She died with hope, and with meaning, and with sharing, and with learning. Her last words to me, aside from pointing out the giant prawn I forgot to eat, was, we've done everything we can, haven't we? And I said, yes, of course we can have. And she held my hand and looked me squarely in the eye and said, no, I mean, we've done everything for everyone, haven't we? I think it's best we hear in her own words what she wanted for others with cancer like her. Seamus Heaney's last words were, Notelli Diperi, uh, no, Notelli Timeri, do not be afraid. <coughs> I am not afraid. I am fearful that this new and important approach may be put into the too difficult box. But I also have such great hope. So many cancer patients collaborate and support each other every day. They create that community of love and determination that they find each other every day. All we now ask is that doctors and health systems learn to do the same and for us to work together to learn from each other. 
In the end, what gives a life meaning is not only how it is lived, but how it draws to a close. I hope that this debate will give hope to other cancer patients like me so that we can live well together with cancer, not just dying of it. All of us for longer. Thank you. Find the Ernest Shackleton inside of you. Find the Tessa Jowell inside of you. So for all those who find themselves drowning in the incurable sea, we can find cures faster. And if not cures, then learning. And if not learning, then meaning. And even if not that, then hope. This way, we can work together as patients and doctors to find new routes to treatment, not just for billionaires, but for the billions. This way, we can all live better with incurable cancer and not just be dying from it. Thank you.